there's just a big gap between that starting process and where they need to be and what they need. I've been overusing uh, Bezos' quote lately. As he says, you should be stubborn on vision but flexible on details. Yeah. I also run a team out of India. I know a lot of folks who have teams in Mexico, South America, Argentina. Philippines is growing up a lot for like administrative work, design work, video editing work. A bunch of folks are um, tapping talent pools over there. Exactly, and they are able to deliver and over deliver most of the times. So uh, that's something that we were able to build as a brand and we're gonna grow continuously. Having specific know-how that can be translated into intellectual property, that as well. What do you wanna do over the next three to five years? How do you think about planning for your agency and then follow on. Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Kathleen. He's been a founder of various companies like Deliver Me and Notifier app. You're a podcast host at your podcast called A Day in the Future. You're a co-founder and advisor at a company called Nutriento and your main gig, which is Linify, your co-founder and CEO at. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Can you just briefly talk about what you're trying to do at Linify and what your mission is? So our mission statement is simplifying life through innovation. That's what Linify comes from. Life, innovation, simplify. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Now, what I personally do is make sure we have a, a unique value add to how we create products, digital products from idea to product market fit. And uh, this translates into having a unique validation process, for example, that we use, um, creating uh, partnerships with relevant stakeholders like accelerators, VCs, associations that are meant to be engaged at that point of the journey for a startup or a spin-off sometimes. So that's what I focus most. Got it. Yeah. You mentioned product market fit. I always like to ask my guests, what do you think product market fit is and how do you define that? So you can either um, go in terms of metrics and uh, there's this uh, uh, methodology used by the founder of Super Superhuman, the 40% yeah. rule. Yeah, so you know about it. Yeah. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it or you just feel it. Uh, I mean, you just feel it. And... Uh, a concrete example would be when you get surprised of hearing about your product from someone that you have no idea who it is yeah. and uh, you've never tried to market to that person, but somehow they found about your product because it's so damn good. So, yeah. Nice. So at Linify, you're working with a lot of folks, taking their ideas to market, validating, figuring out PMF, GTM for them, go to market mm -hmm. for them. What do, you think's one, what do you think is one problem that a lot of the folks you work with tend to repeat over and over again. And what I'm trying to get at is I work with a lot of folks, try to go zero to one with them as well. And I feel like there's a big misconception with, hey, here's what my idea is. Here's what I want to build. And here's how long it should take. There's just a big gap between that yeah. starting process and where they need to be and what they need. And so you've worked with a bunch of folks Mm -hmm. What do you think is one, or, or not even one, a couple things that they seem to get traditionally very wrong? Well, uh, trying to launch the perfect thing from the beginning, right. that's the biggest pitfall because that comes with costs, with energy, with time spent in, the dire in a direction that you might believe is the right one and there's a very small chance that it actually is 100%. because you will need to pivot uh, like i've never heard about a startup that found the right recipe from the beginning yeah. so you just might as well start faster start with a version that includes uh, the key elements that are able to deliver your unique value proposition in the market and go from there and uh, Yes, yeah, sometimes, and I think that's a trait that's good to have as a founder, sometimes they believe too much in their product. 100%. What I recommend is believing in your vision and how you get there, it's going to change. 100%. I've been overusing uh, Bezos' quote lately. 
uh, as he says, you should be stubborn on vision but flexible on details. So that's nice. That's the approach. What's your recommendation to someone listening who's has an idea, wants to validate? How should they go about structuring that idea, mm-hmm. trying to get to essential validation steps to figure out what does your product look like? What's your go-to framework, method, or just overall S- high-level approach? So I, I recommend like a list of uh, methodologies that you should go through, but what we um, use is a five-step process. And it starts by understanding what problem are you solving, a very clear problem statement with a corresponding target market. So that's important to start with because the next step is understanding that market and going into lean market research, how I like to call it, because you're not going to be spending tens of thousands of dollars on it. You're just going to be spending tens of, not really thousands, but hundreds of hours of your own time into understanding what the market uh, needs and how uh, well their problem is currently solved by uh, the competition. So that's what I would recommend. Diving deep into conversations, into surveys, into understanding the things that you don't, you do not know, you not know. 100%. So, yeah. After doing that, next step is refining a unique value proposition, something that has, uh, you, you need to have a very good and compelling answer on why would your target market choose to solve their problem to you instead of any other yeah. alternatives in the market. And, and then you start building. Yeah. So in that process, so you talk about problem statement, sort of ICP target market, customer mm-hmm. profile target market, uh, market research, and then the fourth point would be what's your unique value prop or US, like yeah. unique selling prop, uh, USP for that problem and solution. Exactly, yeah. At what point in this process do you have to restructure and start from the scratch? And so, how and how, on general, how many times does that happen? So I start out with problem statement A, ICP A, and I'm going and doing research and maybe part of my problem statement is invalidated. Maybe my target market's not the correct yeah. target market. So how many times do you generally see folks going through that cycle and repetition Mm -hmm. before they get to the point where, okay, I've figured out all these four things and I'm ready to build V1? Yeah, it's interesting. Like um, the ones that haven't talked on their own before going into market research with the market, the ones that only had their idea for themselves and sort of like uh, fantasized about it, they are the ones that usually invalidate even the problem. Yeah. when they start out because uh, first you need to have a problem validation and that's usually done through service uh, it's quantitatively yeah. you need to be able to identify that it is a pain and the target market is willing to pay at least the willing part initially before you actually want to to test out whether they would pay or not so i'd say that the more time they've spent before on their own without going through a specific methodology and understanding the problem the higher the chance of them not needing to go back to the drawing board for the problem validation part. Now, uh, if they're confident that the problem is there, and usually you you can, uh, by the way they talk about the problem, you can already understand if they know if it's validated or not. Now, after that, going into the solution space, that's that's the next step in which uh, it, it all starts with having a clear value proposition and as I was saying in the market research phase, you need to be able to identify what gap, what's what's that area in how the market is being served where you can come in with something that's different and better and usually needs to be 10 times better if you're a startup. So, yeah. So in this process of validation, you talk mm-hmm. a lot about doing surveys, reaching out to folks, getting in touch with customers. What's your go-to method to help a founder get in front of a lot of eyes. Because mm-hmm. I talk to a lot of founders who, you know, they're not the best sales folks. They don't have distribution. They're not big on social media. So how should someone who wants to build out a problem, have a problem that they want to try to solve, how should they get in front of potential customers? What's the recommendation there? Or what's your go-to strategy so, there? So uh, obviously it really depends. <laughs> if you're going to B2C or B2B, if you're going to uh, sell to businesses, then 
for the the easiest way to do it is to just go to industry conferences but you need to get out there you yeah. really need to talk yeah. but if you have a clear script from the beginning what you want to ask them and you're really specific in your questions they'll enjoy the conversation mm -hmm. and it will be a good conversation they will also get to learn by telling you about their problems that's what i would recommend in industry conferences yeah if you're doing, uh, if you're selling to businesses, if it's in the B two C space, it's pretty simple. You need to put a bit of investment into some vouchers that you're gonna. Yeah, yeah you you just need to put something there. Some incentive structure. Yeah, you. or you can go into um, communities that uh, have your ICP, uh, mm -hmm. be it online communities, I don't know, uh, Facebook, Slack, whatever. And uh, if you're passionate about the problem that you want to solve, uh, I'm pretty confident that people will, will talk to you. Uh, each time the the founder was passionate about what they want to solve, people were willing to talk to them. Makes sense. Yeah. And they need to speak passionately about it. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. I think one thing founders get a little wrong, or mm -hmm. not, not even wrong, but they're just not super comfortable with, is the sales side, is the talking to customer side, is the explaining your problem solution value problem because yeah they're so hell-bent on their idea their vision and maybe they're technical and someone listening on the other side is very outcome driven they care about how are you going to solve this problem for me what's my benefit mm -hmm. they don't care about how they don't care about your complex exactly. model or ai yeah. on the background my take is that if you know how to simply convey hey you're losing 30 percent revenue here you use my tool here's what we do you reduce that to 10%. Relatively simple way to understand. And then if you're hitting the right notes, if you're gauging the right problem, you can then explain how. But initially, being able to simplify what you're doing and how you're doing, I think is tough for a lot of founders. Yeah, you, you, you're right. Well, so what I see is, so in what you were saying, I believe they already went a bit through the journey because they already have a product that they want to sell. Now, what, what I would recommend them if they haven't started building anything yet and uh, there's no reason in testing out whether it's needed in the market or not, is just going out there and talk to at least 10 people from that fit your ICP and start talking about the problem that you want to solve so you can get a bit of their understanding and view of the, of the space. Because that's how they're going to be able to clearly communicate the 30% yeah. problem that you ta talked yeah. about. Yeah. Shifting gears a little bit, so you had founded two different companies mm -hmm. early on in your career. Can you briefly talk about what happened with them? Did you step down? Did you shut down the company? What was the yeah. outcome of those two companies? So Deliver Me and Notifier, yeah. those were two, I would say, products of Linify. Yeah. So Deliver Me was the first product that Linify launched uh, on the market. It was our first year of activity yeah. back when we were in university. So it was sort of like an Instacart, or, but for the Romanian market, yeah. first of, uh, of this kind. So in nine months, we did everything from uh, being the builders, the coders, the designers, the customer support, the delivery man, yeah, the yeah. business development, everything. So nine months of intense, uh, I would say... Um, MBA, practical MBA experience. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what happened is that we generated some very loyal clients, I would say, but we needed uh, additional capital yeah. in order to fund such uh, development. Growth, now, yeah. we didn't even knew about private capital at that time or we weren't that aware of it. Makes sense. And it wasn't such a big scene in Romania as well. So what we started to do is uh, um, make sure we were sustainable financially. And we started to develop products for Other people, yeah, yeah. startups that were from the US and Germany mostly. Yeah. So that was the story of Deliver Me. Got it. Now the other one, Notifier. So it was an app that uh, let you be the first one that finds out what on a uh, particular rent or apartment or car or whatever that's uh, sold on the secondary market in Romania. Right. Yeah. So if you were looking for a specific car, Romanians do this a lot, like buying secondhand yeah. cars, and you had some clear specification, it's really important if it's a good deal to be the first that calls the Makes seller. Yeah. So that's what we did. Uh, we, we, we were quite successful there, uh, I'd say, it, but it wasn't aligned with our passion for what we want to Makes develop. Sense. Uh, we got to um, present it on the national IT whatever uh, show that happens in Romania. And uh, we got to have some 
again, pretty loyal customers because even after we pause development, people would uh, ask us like, what's wrong? I want, I want to get my notifications. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What are, what is one or two key learnings that you take away from building those two apps, eventually shutting them down? And mm -hmm. what's something you take away from that experience? So from the, from, from the last one, uh, it's the fact that you need to have a strong why and vision when you start out, if you want to go the long road yeah because we didn't have a strong vision we didn't have a strong why it was in line with our passion necessarily it was more opportunistic i would say and for the first one um there were just too many learnings uh, to, to be honest like that's when we actually uh got in uh, touch with the business world it was our first business experience overall i i'd say that it only proved to us that if you are if you have a good team and a co cohesive team. If you have a market that uh, likes your product, um, anything can happen. Like for me, it's what it what gave me confidence that if you really want to do something, it's it's gonna happen. Now you also need to be uh, paying attention to how you're gonna fund it, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, plan in advance. But I think that's something that uh, we had to learn during the years. Would you say you're more of a builder or more of an operator um, as a... So I'd say builder and operators are pretty close to one another. Um, so I, I'd say I'm more of a seller, a visionary more, more okay. than... Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, but I do like to, to get involved in the building space as well. Right. Yeah. The reason I ask is having built a couple companies and spun off ideas from zero to one. So you've experienced sort of the thrill of that journey of like seeing something hit, gain traction, make money, figure out yeah. scalability, go to market. Have doing doing this at Linify for other folks, how often are you pulled towards, oh, that's a nice idea, let's try that, or that's a nice idea, let's build a product? Or are you very strict with, hey, we're going to deliver for clients and not really have experimentation of our own or how do you balance those two yeah so it's been a tough journey doing that but now i i think we had to gain maturity in focusing on the right things when it comes to the business and having something that uh, will be able to provide us with a big paycheck yeah uh, after the years so i think we've minimized our budget and spent on ideas and r d through the years because we had some experiences that almost made us uh, not exist anymore yeah so yeah right now for example we are allocating a strict budget of 50k for this year for 2024 on internal ideas and whether it is team allocation or marketing spend whatever that's the that's maximum cap, yeah. yeah 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 and so does that force you to be more selective with what you try out or does it allow you to do a little bit on a lot of ideas and see what gains traction. So how do you think about that allocation? Because when you're more cost constrained, whether it's time and money mm -hmm. or whether it's marketing spend, I'm guessing you're either only picking two or three banger ideas. Yeah. Or are you like trying a little bit of a lot of ideas? So first of all, what it brings us is increased focus yeah. on the 100%. core business and servicing our clients 100%. at the best that's the most <laughs> that's the main benefit the second one would be focusing on only some yeah the the, the one or two ideas and it cannot you two max like yeah <laughs> even having two ideas with that type of budget for uh, for a year it can be a bit stretched but being able to focus i would say that's the that's that's I, what i'd recommend yeah. yeah the reason i ask is um there was a phase where I was like get, spinning off a lot of landing pages, a lot of ideas with my team. And if I didn't find traction, I would just shelf them, make it a case study. That's fine. I'm not too worried about that. I was having a conversation with someone in Austin and they said, are you giving your ideas enough room to reach velocity? Because maybe you're on the right track yeah. or you're stopping too soon. Maybe just a little more, try one or two more channels and maybe they would gain tra traction. And I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know if I am shutting them off too soon or not. But I think it also comes down to knowing why do I want to build this? Yeah. Why do I like this idea? If I've lost faith in the idea or the thesis, or I think the thesis is invalidated, maybe it makes a little bit of money. Maybe it becomes a small lifestyle business or a lifestyle app. 
but I don't want to do that. Like I, I'm not trying to build lifestyle apps, right? So mm-hmm. I'm fine shutting them down. But when when someone asked me that question, I was like, maybe there's something there. Maybe we keep the ideas in a state where they're just on the shelf. There's a live demo working, and in a couple months, a year, if something clicks, and I'm like, oh, maybe let's pick that up back up and try to see what happens. But um, I don't know if you have opinions on cutting them too short because with the limited budget, are you allowing enough runway throughput for the idea to materialize or? So I, how I would look at it, um, if you want to build a startup, a, disrupt, a tech startup, something that's really disrupting the yeah. way we live, uh, you need to have a strong why and vision from the start. And that will make you go on and on and on and uh, don't stop because solutions are always there 100 percent. just need to find them yeah but in order to find them you need to spend huge amounts of time energy stress whatever yeah but you find them but if you look at uh opportunistic um um businesses that you can make i i would say that this would be more similar to looking at you know like selling products or on amazon you know like having that type of mentality and having a clear system on how you validate, invalidate, whether it's something that can uh, bring you money or not. Yeah. Having a very clear system on how you do that, yeah, it makes sense because that's a system. It's a machine that you're using in order to generate revenue. But when it's when it comes to building a startup, I yeah, I I look at a strong vision. One thing that I wanted to just get your take on is how do you think about shiny object syndrome? How do you, is it? Do you often get pulled into directions where like oh that's a cool tech that's a new idea that's something nice that's happening there's a bunch of ai happening nowadays yeah. and there's a lot of cool ai applications are you very focused on what you're delivering for your clients and how do you avoid sort of going towards the shiny object so it's very hard to like th- those that's why they're shiny because <laughs> they attract you and they capture your attention but again like through the years i've managed to develop this uh, focus uh, ability yeah. like whatever new shiny object comes first i look at the overall strategy of vision of our company now does this shiny object uh, help me make my overall company and goals shinier if not if it's only gonna uh, distract it and not be a value add to what i'm already doing yeah i'm gonna look away because uh, there's also gonna there are always gonna be newer and shinier objects along the way if it can compound on what i'm doing right now yeah i'm gonna definitely try to integrate and include that into what i'm doing um but the ability to keep focus i think that's I mean, it was uh, the the best quality that Steve Jobs had. At least that's what I've heard from his peers. But yeah, it's damn difficult because it means you're committed and you have conviction that what you're building matters and that's what's going to change the world, not the shiny objects around. Yeah. Do you ever think about, so having focus, knowing your mission... How often do you revisit and make sure you're on the right path with the right mission, the right vision? Because there's chances that your original thesis gets invalidated or what you're trying to do changes with the amount of tech and AI that's coming up. So how often do you revisit sort of your goal, mission, vision and be like, hey, we have to modify this because, you know, environment and industry has changed. So we have to adapt. Or are you so solid on your vision that you don't think anything's going to affect it for the next three to five years or however far in the future you look. Mm -hmm. So the vision usually stays the same because it's very abstract. It's very vague. It's very, it's, it's just how, how does the world change because you exist? And that can be very abstract, you know, and that's how I like it to be. It needs to communicate feelings and it needs to communicate what value add will you bring in the world, but in in a, in a, at a very abstract level okay that comes with some values with some missions with some direct with strategic directions that you have for your company and uh, what we do is we update this we take a hard look at it once every year yeah at a company level uh then in a tactical in the tactical planning for a quarterly uh planning what we do is revise them again on a quarterly basis. But for me, on a personal level, I think 
there are times when I'm looking at it every once few days just to make sure that my actions align with the market and what yeah and what the vision is. Sometimes it takes weeks. Like whenever something's not going right, I take a hard look at the vision and the results in the market and pivot. Nice. I like yeah. that. Shifting gears a little bit to you spend part of your year in Austin, you spend part of your year in Europe traveling. How do you manage client expectation, your employee expectations, and how do you think about sort of this cross-functional environment where you may not be co-located with the team? I don't know if you guys have an office or you're like so we have an remote. office. Yeah, we have an office. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, it's amazing vibes whenever I'm there. Uh, so I'd say having a very strong team, um, trust within the team. Yeah. And the uh, ability to communicate, I don't know, like even when you're communicating, having the ability to communicate, I, I don't even know how to explain that. But sometimes when you talk to someone, if it's a special team member that you're building something with and uh, you know each other maybe more than yeah. you, your spouses know each other from a business standpoint. Yeah, yeah. So having that ability to communicate through a few words, maybe hundreds of thousands of ideas, yeah. I would say just... That makes it easier to be here and um, be aligned at the same time with what's happening with your there. team there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, would you say so? How important is team culture for you, and how do you go about building sort of the culture within your organization? Yeah. So, uh, uh, just like that saying, if you want to go uh, fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And uh, th- having some clear values that are shared by everyone in in especially when you're starting up that's what we did when we were uh i think 18 people uh we felt that we need some values because everyone had values and we said okay but how are we gonna pick them well let's pick them together and that's what we did uh, we had some workshops done over two days and it wasn't that corporate it just was okay what makes you what well, what feelings does this team give you like what makes you feel like you're a part of a team what excites about being part of a team everyone uh shared their perspectives and then we created some conglomerates around what uh, were common teams and we got to authenticity unit and vision in our case nice and uh yeah that's something that we feel and we communicate and we um we embody in everything we do when we work and i think that's something that creates cohesion that's something that uh, creates communication for non-communication yeah. nice how big is your team now so right now we're 32 nice yeah all devs or no we are also like devs design product managers okay. nice. yeah. yeah what's one common misconception that clients have about engaging an offshore team well it depends where the offshore teams are uh obviously um communication uh, especially, I think they aren't aware of the level of communication that uh, offshore companies can provide. Yeah. And after they do engage with us, they are surprised each time. Yeah. And uh, I'm happy that uh, our team is able to to generate that sort of impression yeah. in the world. Um, other than that, I would say that having lower prices, but of course, like th- th- it needs to be lower. Yeah. But not. Uh, I, I think you would have to look at value and have a good price ratio on the value that's given. That's what I do whenever I uh, have uh, a vendor engage with me. And uh, other misconceptions, I'm I'm not sure. The reason I ask is, um, so I I also run a team out of India. I know a lot of folks who have teams in Mexico, South America, Argentina. Philippines is growing up a lot for like administrative work, design work, video editing work. Yeah. A bunch of folks are um, tapping uh, talent pools over there. I think the one thing that irritates me or not even irritates or just I have to have a lot of these conversations when you come to me expecting a full enterprise build, but you want the price of someone who's on Upwork and quotes you 4,000 bucks, right? And I'm not saying don't go to the guy in Upwork. What I'm saying is, like you said, understand the value that you're getting and understand what that costs in terms of man hours. Forget about 
we're running a business, we need our own margins because why would I run a business without any profit margins, right? But just sometimes the client expectation of going from, oh, here's what I think this worth is work. And just because you're offshore, it has to be 10% of the cost. But if they go onshore, they're willing to pay full price. And that mm-hmm. I think that's just lack of understanding and lack of um, knowing how to build product, knowing how, knowing what goes into the process, right? Um, but I've had so many of those conversations where the client will end up saying, but this guy said this much. I'm like, I'm happy for you to go with that person. Like, I don't want to compete. I don't, I'm not on a price race to zero, right? Go with that person. If you have a good experience, great. I, I'm not I'm not going to be like, no, I'll do it 10% cheaper than that guy. But there tends to be a lot of service owners who play a price game. Mm-hmm. And that's where I'm like, it just creates bad sentiment. Yeah. And then it affects everyone else in the space. But just a mini rant. But yeah. Yeah, no, no, I get, I get it. Fortunately, in the last couple of years, since we've focused on that validation driven yeah. approach and st- stuff, like that, we didn't have that many conversations. But I do believe we've had less leads that because <laughs> I, I think we've qualified a bit better uh, the sort of uh, yeah, yeah the conversations that we had regarding. Yeah. Uh, I met someone in Austin. And I'm like, what do you guys do? He's like, yeah, we do dev work for clients. And like, we primarily focus on customers who've had a bad experience offshore. Oh, yeah. And so they're coming onshore to hire us because whoever they were with messed there. And I'm like... The fact that that exists, I feel, is the problem with the space. But great, he's right. he's found a niche to target folks. Yeah. But I feel like that should never be an outcome. Like there should be enough processes, communication standards in place where I feel like that can be avoided. But when you start playing, uh, who can be the cheapest in a situation? That's where you end up getting customers who are unhappy, service owners are happy. It's just a bad balance. Well, you, you need to be aware of the budget that you have and the type of value that you can get. That's 100%. why, like, when I have a smaller budget on, uh, especially in startups, like, I will expect if I'm going to pay less to receive a bit less. And if I am able to somehow squeeze more value as much as I can, while, of course, uh, being uh, respectable of, yeah. of the services that's being provided to me, I, I'm going to do that. But uh, yeah, I my expectations are are clearly aligned to 100%. what I'm giving as value. Yeah, hundred percent. And I feel like that's where folks sometimes get it wrong. But again, mm-hmm. part of the part of the process, right? Yeah, yeah. What's your goal with Linify? What do you want to do over the next three to five years? How do you think about planning for your agency? And mm-hmm. then follow on question to that. Let's say the fifty k you spend towards internal builds something pans out and like you find a lot of traction. Mm -hmm. How do you think about growing that? Do you spin off? Like, how do you manage these two arms? Because again, there's the service versus the innovation. Mm -hmm. So how do you plan that out three to five years? How do you just think about big picture? So to be honest, I've quite pivoted a bit in the last couple of months uh, on what we're going to do there. So um, we've taken a more pragmatic approach to what will come. And we actually do have uh, one product that's generating traction right now. And it might be that one that we're talking about, that 50K, whatever. Uh, So our vision is to be the place that transforms authentic ideas into successful and scalable products in the market. So being the best place to go yeah, yeah, uh, to a phase in which all you need to do is share it with the world because you've created something that's of real value. That's why we've developed our validation process and continuously learning and uh, doing more and more to be better at that. Um, What I imagine is being the place where it doesn't matter whether you have, you are funded or um, you are already coming in to receive services and paying for them. It is the best place if you have an authentic original idea in mind and you want to transform that into pure value in the market this linifies the place where you're going to do that the fastest uh, the best and uh, yeah b- with the highest rate of success yeah. now that's the vision for linify uh first we need to have some big success stories of our own i would say in order to be able to do that yeah. and uh, how it's gonna look in terms of uh, how the company operates what it's gonna look like is it a conglomerate is it whatever i think that's gonna 
need to pan out after we do validate this ourselves and uh, achieve success. Uh, if not, what we're that's why we're focusing on having excellent uh, core services as well, so that uh, we have the flexibility to exit if we want to do that at one point, to have the flexibility of knowing that we've already built a solid and performing business that uh, has a value in the market already. Nice. Yeah. How do you... Th so, from the point of view of you're building an agency, you have a product that's gaining traction. Do you ever worry about multiples? And the reason I ask is a lot of consultancy service agen agencies sell for three times revenue or three times EBITDA, depending on mm -hmm. the market and the kind of agency. Because at the core of it, you're directly selling time and there's a cap on how much mm -hmm. time you can sell because you have only so many employees. And so the only way to scale there is get more employees, have more consulting hours to be able to um, yeah. sell versus a tech product sells for 10x revenue and sells for 10x, or whatever multiples depends on market, right? But much greater than whatever a service agency does. Um, how do you how do you think about that dynamic? And the reason I ask is sometimes I talk to agency owners who are like, you know, I'm struggling to go from six figures to seven figures, but the, the exit in sight is also never a $100 million exit, a $200 million exit, because a smaller agency mm -hmm. can only sell for so much, right? Mm -hmm. How do you think about the balance between exiting a service agency versus exiting a tech product because you are innovating, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you stay focused on one and not get geared towards the other? Uh, so regarding the focus part, having uh, clear accountability internally on how much time we spend there and uh, being very cautious of the R&D budget and like checking upon it each yeah. month with very strict rules on yeah. whether we raise it or not and usually we don't raise it that's one thing in terms of keeping focus now on the multiples on the agency side there are some things that you can do in order to increase the uh, increase okay. the multiples as well uh having a strong brand that can sell at premium prices yeah. that's what we're focusing on so uh i wouldn't say that all but most of our customers consider us expensive but uh, that's fine because we do have some of the top talent and you've built all you've also built up the credibility in the rep. exactly and they are able to deliver and over deliver most of the times so uh, that's something that we were able to build as a brand and we're going to grow uh, continuously having specific know-how that can be translated into intellectual property that as well and finding ways in which you can uh, have productized versions of your services nice. that's what we're experimenting with now nice. uh, i'm not able to say right now that it's a passive income yeah. but it does come with uh, bigger margins yeah yeah so two questions on the productized side uh i've watched a lot of folks who do it there's some stuff i'm also trying to figure out mm -hmm. on the productized side a lot of folks i've talked to have said that the productized offering got them really low lead quality compared to what they would like for their business mm. because the way they had product and maybe this is very dependent on what they were doing but the productized offering made it so easy and simple that folks just entered their funnel and they wanted the service but they were a really bad client to work with they didn't truly understand the service they mm. wanted a lot more um, have you faced that yet or you're still not, um, you haven't seen that? What I've yeah. seen working uh, multiple times and even from companies from Romania like UiPath, what they did was build a product-led business yeah. that comes with uh, many implementation fees. And uh, I think what, they're, what they were able to do very well is uh, business analysis that can create a description of a product that you can start selling. And even though you're not quite there yet, you're going to start building it one, once you sell. Yeah. And it's not really a... In their case, for example, it is the, the productized version of their uh, RPA processes because what they were doing, they were helping companies automate their businesses to... Uh, software robots now what they did is okay since we're doing this we have a framework on how we do that 
uh, this is our product. Now we're going to sell our product. Makes sense. Yeah, and we're going to help you use the product. And uh, in this sense, if you come up from the start with this uh, uh, positioning, it's clear that it's a complex product, it's a value-add product, yep. but it's going to be cheaper. There's also expertise in it. And, uh, and Makes all, sense. Yeah. Okay, I like that. You mentioned bu- you've built up a company brand where you can demand a higher price point. Mm-hmm. How do you think about company brand versus personal brand? And what do you focus on more? Do you focus on building your personal brand more or do you focus on building Linify's company brand more? Mm -hmm. So uh, whenever it comes to my public persona, I almost uh, constantly tie it to Linify. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But I I do believe that personal brand is important, especially in a services industry, because when you're buying services, you're buying from people. And you trust people. You don't uh, necessarily trust the features and quality of a product. You trust the competency, the reliability, and uh, how that person is able to deliver value. And it starts with with people. Yeah. Yeah. So building a strong personal brand, I think it's essential. And not only for the founders, but also uh, doing that for all of your team members. Whenever there's an opportunity for them to build their personal brand create that and uh, push them to so that they can grow even further and i think that's that combined with a strong focus on how are you different as a brand as a company brand and aligning those two together nicely that's what what provides the use case and the opportunity to yeah demand premium prices the reason i ask is um I, w- I joined this agency group and there was a call the other day where someone was asking personal brand versus company brand. Mm-hmm. And a nine figure agency owner was saying, I only get 5% of deals because of my personal brand. But if you, and he referenced all these agencies that have existed for 30 years before personal brand was a thing. Personal brand only became a really big thing over the last three, four years with uh, boom in social media. Mm-hmm. And he's like, these company have, companies have existed. They're publicly traded. Some are private. They're doing nine figures, eight figures, a billion dollars in revenue. There's no concept of personal brand there. And that was the first time I heard a big agency owner say, I would focus on building your company's brand and double down on your company's brand because that allows you to garner a higher price point, allows you to build a brand, and the brand also lives on even if you want to step aside. Because yeah. if you tie it too much to a personal brand then you're always going to be like yeah. semi stuck in the business or the, the business is just not going to grow. And just wanted your take on that because that, I think that was the first time I heard someone say, focus on company brand more than personal brand. It depends on the timing, I would say. Yeah. hundred percent. Like in the beginning, you need to focus on the personal brand because that's what you have. Well, that's yeah. what you start with. And yeah, tie it from the beginning with your company brand. So it's easy for people then to, to yeah, it, it won't be about the person, it would be about the brand in yeah. time. Because like, even if you look at uh, McKinsey, uh, they started with, uh, they had two co-founders. Yeah, the McK- partners, the original yeah. partners, yeah. And McKinsey, he was a well-respected and reputable professor, and he came up with uh, some specific frameworks, and yeah. he was well-known for the level of quality that he provides when it comes to management consulting. Now, that's what they build upon. But then, of course, the brand in itself became something. Makes sense. I like that. I like that dynamic. Sweet. Yeah. Um, I like to ask a couple sets of questions towards the end of every Mm. episode. What would you say is your support system? My support system. What allows you to keep going, live in two countries, manage remote team, manage Mm -hmm. clients, just be on the grind? What's your support system? Okay, so if if it's to look inside, it would be that fuel, that why, the fact that I, I really cannot see myself doing anything else than what I'm doing right now, and it's really important for me. And then if you look on the outside, is people, the, the people that are around me and uh, the trust that they have in me and, uh, I don't know, the feelings that they give me whenever I'm speaking about what I'm doing and uh, they are giving me confidence that it's not even, uh, I'm not even scratching the surface, nice. that it's more to come. So yeah, my, my wife, <laughs> uh, 
she's my biggest supporter, my biggest fan, and I'm hers. And uh, we're partners in this life. And the fact that I have such a partner provides me much support. And then my family, of course, and uh, my business associates, uh, and the trust that we have between each other that no matter what happens, we're going to win together and we're going to win big. Nice. Yeah. I like that. What's your startup tech stack? How do you run your company? Mm. And if you could walk me briefly through all the tools you use from sales, client management, tech stack, coding, whatever you want to cover. Okay. So uh, when... So for project management, we do work with the Atlassian suite, okay. so Jira Confluence. Nice. For communication, we do Slack. Uh, that's something that, yeah. I don't know, I just love their UX and the way they've managed to transform how you communicate internally. Um, for sales, we use HubSpot. Okay. And right now we are playing with and experimenting with different uh, outbound solutions like Instantly, uh, the Growth Machine, Apollo AI for prospect. Yeah. Like right now, we haven't found the tech stack yet. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully, we have it by the end of uh, the next quarter. Okay. Uh, and in terms of how we develop products, we mostly use Figma for rapid prototyping yeah. and uh, Adobe Creative Cloud. And for building products, uh, we are focused on TypeScript and Python. Nice. Yeah. So you use Python backends mostly, or yeah. okay, nice. Yeah. No GS and Python. Okay. Yeah. Django Flask framework or Django. Yeah. Okay, yeah. nice. Pretty cool. What are three resources that you'd recommend to someone listening? Hmm. And this could be whatever kind of resource. For, and if you want to focus on the topic, great. If not, yeah, of course. Also work. So, um, hmm. I'd recommend one book that I like enjoy. Um, uh, like there are a lot of books, but I'm just gonna go with the most recent one that uh, I listened to actually, and it's Elon Musk's uh, biography, biography yeah. that you can hear on Audible. Yeah. It's just amazing the the sheer uh, confidence and mental power that he's been able to go through. I think that can inspire any founder that uh, they can achieve anything if they set their mind to and they really believe in it and. They're going to give you their all to do it. Um, other than that, resources like listening to podcasts like yours, <laughs> that's something that I would recommend. Uh, also, the All In podcast, if okay. they want to get a bit in touch with what's happening in the VC world, startup world, tech world. And uh, from what perspective? Because you, you asked me. No, me. so I mean, so if you want to focus on validation, GTM, go to market, that also works. If you want to be more generic, that's also fine. Um, yeah, yeah. If yeah. there's anything that comes to mind that, like, if you're thinking about idea validation, communities. There's a really yeah, so yeah. communities. Yeah, you need to be part. Like wherever you're living, if you're in Austin, go and be part of the communities of startups that exist out there. Like there's Fiesta, there's AVA. Uh, there are many, many yeah. communities. Nice, sweet. Um, I do this segment in every episode where I've asked a previous guest for a question. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you their question, and then I'll ask you for a question as well for whoever my next guest Okay, is. sounds good. So your question is, what was the exact time or moment where you knew that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? It's interesting because when I was in high school, I wanted to be a lawyer. And I actually went to law school and also became a lawyer. Uh, but when... I think I always knew, <laughs> in a sense. I don't know. Like when I was little, I used to sell things with my like my parents used to sell stuff, clothes and such back home in Romania, and I would go and sell. You know those little diskette games that you would play for. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Game Boy and Nintendo. Kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. I I used to to sell those there, and I don't know. It just it felt like that's something that I I like doing just because it's. It provides in the independence and autonomy and uh, yeah, being able to communicate and being able to to sell something. Do you remember your first sale? Oh, yeah. yeah it was hard. <laughs> it was hard in the sense that I had to convince why it's actually really valuable to... <laughs> and it was, it was, but I had to understand their needs. I had to understand uh, why it makes sense for them to buy and why it will make their life better. Nice. Yeah. Pretty cool. What's your question for a future guest? 
Yeah, for a future guest. Um, hmm. What are you most excited about? What technology are you most excited about that will uh, take shape in 10 years from now? Okay. Yeah. Do you have an answer? No, no, no. I would have. <laughs> I had to think about it. Do okay. you want me to think about it? Right no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just curious. Um, because the last guest who asked you the question, he's like Feb 22, 2018 was the day I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And, and so, why? Why was it? Um, he he was built. I I knew him from UT. Mm -hmm. He was building. Um, he's building a drone company right now for agricultural drones, but he remembers the day where someone handed them a 30k check, 20k check for one of the drones they have made. Mm -hmm. And he's like, that was the moment where I knew that, okay, this can be a thing. I like this. I want to do this. Mm -hmm. I want to build my own company. Because up until then, they had only made a couple hundred dollars here and there. But they had made a drone. They went to a drone show and someone handed them a check at the show. Like, I'm going to take this home. And mm -hmm. that was like enough validation. He's like, that was the day I knew that. Yeah. Th I want to make sure this, I build this and it works. That first check hits differently yeah i can tell you that yeah. yeah like the first 1k that we invoiced i will remember them more than any other invoice that i that i was able to issue yeah yeah sweet i like that um but yeah where can listeners find you what do you want to plug what can we link for you in the description so linkedin is where i uh, share most of my stuff yeah and what i do also on instagram but that's more like uh, not necessarily personal but uh, Stuff that less business, more yeah, has to fun. do more with hobbies, and yeah, yeah, what I like in life, philosophy, stuff like that, and the podcast, yeah, a day in the future, that's nice. and we'll link everything, yeah. And thank you for coming on. Well, thanks for inviting me. Are you yeah. gonna enjoy Europe over the next couple, oh, three definitely. months, four months? Looking forward uh, the Get next the weekend heat. in Greece. Yeah, nice, sweet. But we'll we'll touch base when you're back. But thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks.